we're starting a, a new year and taking a little deviation for a couple weeks from the revised common lectionary readings to do a series this week. And I encourage you to uh, open in the scripture, uh, the Pew Bible, you will find John 13 on page 874 or 1673. And I just want to encourage you to uh, follow along in the scripture as you come each week. Maybe even bring your own Bible with you. Um, it's, it's important to uh, not just hear the word, but to kind of make the connections as we go through a message. So I encourage you to open that scripture and to keep it open in front of you. John 13, I'm going to read the first 17 verses. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around, them, around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not every one was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for uh, times of, of song, times of prayer, uh, and now time to come into hearing your word and to hearing your voice. And so, Father, we remove distractions from us in these moments and help us to hear your voice, to hear your heart, and to align our hearts with yours. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. So during the month of January, I'm going to do a series on service. Now, there are generally two things that people really don't like their pastors to talk about, and that's money and serving. And I, I understand those things. Uh, money, Jesus talked more about money than he did about any other single subject in Scripture. And serving, he talked about it a lot. Uh, and I know, because I sit up here, and so I have a different view when we have uh, people get up and say, we need people to do this, you know what generally happens? <laughs> you don't want to look. But the word serve alone in the NIV appears over 289 times in scripture, and the word servant appears over 750 times. It's a common issue in churches. We just can't get people to serve. The same people are always doing all the work. And so this month, we're going to look at um, some different things. Next week, we're going to look at the body of service, spiritual gifts. Then we're going to look at improving your serve. And then the last week in fulfilling our purpose. But today, we're going to start out by talking about why do we serve? Because I think some of the issue, a lot of the issue in the church is that we have a misunderstanding of why we serve. We think that we're serving because the pastor is making us or someone else is making us, or guilting us into doing. That church leadership just wants more bodies and wants to have us do stuff. That's a misunderstanding. 
And so I want to sh share with you three answers today to the question, why serve? Because there are three reasons, not just why you should serve, but why you need to serve. The first reason that you need to serve is to be obedient to God. In scripture, Jesus commands us to serve, to be servants. A few months ago, we did lessons on how to be great, and we're great in the kingdom of God by serving. In John 15, 14, a few chapters after the passage I read today, Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command. And John, who wrote the gospel, apparently really listened, because in his epistle, 1 John chapter 2, Verses 3 through 5, he says, We know that we have come to know God if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know God, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys God's word, love for God is made complete in them. And so in today's scripture, in verse 15, Jesus says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. He served them. <coughs> He didn't mean go out and wash everybody's feet, literally. He meant serve one another. And so why do we serve? Well, the first reason is to be obedient to God. The second reason to serve is because we love God. And that love that we have for God should naturally overflow in service to others. In Matthew 22, beginning at verse 34, we read this. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. He's saying, Love for God, our obedience to God, our love for God is connected to our love for others. You can't separate the two. And in Luke, when Luke records that same type of a conversation, he immediately tells the story about the Good Samaritan. When the man says, well, who's my neighbor? Who do I have to love? And at the end of the Good Samaritan, Jesus says these words. Go and do likewise. You see, the definition of love is to seek what is best for the other person. Love is expressed in serving other people. Love for God and love for others is connected. Dorothy Day said this, I really only love God as much as I love the person I love the least. Let me read that to you again. I really only love God as much as I love the person I love the least. John, again, in his first epistle, said this, Anyone who claims to be in the light, to know God, but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. I talked about a couple weeks ago, maybe yeah, a couple weeks ago, about the one another's in Scripture. Love one another, encourage one another, pray for one another. And one of them that occurs more than once is serve one another. Serve one another. After Jesus had been resurrected and had appeared to the disciples at the last chapter of the book of John, we see that Peter, who had been, had, uh, betrayed Jesus, had, uh, you know, denied Jesus. He's, he's fishing. He thinks he doesn't have anything left to offer. And Jesus has a conversation with Peter and three times asks him the question, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, you know I do. And Jesus' was re response was, feed my sheep. In other words, serve my people, serve people who need to know me. So why do we serve? We serve because we love God. And if we say we love God and we truly love God, that love is going to overflow in service to other people. The third reason to serve, the third reason that you need to serve, is that it is a necessary element of your spiritual growth and health. How many of you 
were here several months ago when I did my candidate preach. That would have been the week that you voted on whether to call me as your pastor. I preached that week a message that I have preached many times that I have done in retreats on spiritual thriving. You know, people are longing to grow spiritually. I just want to grow spiritually. I, I, I want to be strong and vibrant for the Lord. And there are two elements that always make it into whatever length series I do when I talk about thriving. Is that, yes, we need to dig deep. We need to dig deep into God's word to learn who he is, to understand his heart, to build our relationship with him. But then we have to reach out in service to the world around us. Yes, worship and prayer and study and personal devotion are important. And yes, reaching out and serving is important. It's not either or, it's both and. In the uh, publication Bits and Pieces, in 1992, this was written about Niccolo Paganini. He was a great violinist and he willed his violin to the city of his birth but only on condition that the instrument never be played. It was an unfortunate condition, for it is a peculiarity of wood that as long as it is used and handled, it shows little wear. As soon as it is discarded, it begins to decay. And so the exquisite mellow-toned violin has become worm-eaten in its beautiful case, valueless except as a relic. The moldering instrument is a reminder that a life withdrawn from service to others loses its meaning. You see, if we do not serve, if you do not serve, you will actually become weaker spiritually. I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, I just need to know Jesus more and then I'll be ready to serve. But you can't just take and take and take in without giving out. If you do not serve, you are imbalanced. And instead of being healthy spiritually and being closer to the Lord, you will become more self-focused and more inward-focused and actually weaker because you are not doing what God commanded and created you to do. When Jesus spoke to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, he said, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. It can't stay in if all we do is come to church and worship on Sunday and focus on Bible study. We're, we're just going to become stagnant with what's inside us. And it can't get out to live. A spring is vibrant and living and movement and can't be contained. And that's what Psalm 1, which is the basis of my spiritual thriving message, why, why it says the person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. We dig deep and we know who Jesus is and it becomes the strength and the power for us to serve the people that he has placed around us. John 15, 8, Jesus said, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And so as I was doing some research and reading what some other people had, had preached about serving and things, I found this. There's eight blessings for you that come from serving Serving allows us to discover and to develop our gifts. Serving allows us to experience miracles. As we serve people, we see how God moves in their lives and our own. Serving allows us to experience the joy and peace that comes from obedience. Because remember the first thing? We serve to be obedient. Serving helps us be more like Jesus. Serving surrounds us with other Christians who can help us follow Jesus. There is fellowship and strength in serving together. Serving increases our faith. Serving allows us to experience God's presence in new ways. And I think because of all these things, the last one was serving is good for your soul. 
So why serve? Because you need to serve. It's necessary for your spiritual health and your growth. So the three reasons I've given you about why serve. Obedience, love for God, which overflows to others, and spiritual growth and health. And yet, even if those aren't a surprise to you, we still struggle in churches to have people serve. And I'm convinced uh, part of it is our view and the words we use, because usually people don't come up here and say we need servants. They use a different word. We need volunteers. I don't think that word fits in church. I don't think that's biblical. Over the years, I've thought about that, that, that we talk about volunteering. I am doing something so marvelous to help you. And I struggled with how to really express my problem with using the word volunteer over servant, because after all, aren't I asking you to serve Jesus? And so I found a gentleman, Joseph Yu, I don't know him, but when I read what he wrote, it resonated with my heart, what's important to me, why it's important to me that we call it serving and servants. He says, maybe it's just semantics, but tell sometimes semantics affect our thinking and the way we do things a lot more than you think. When I think of volunteering, I think of helping out with cause because I want to. I also know that my volunteering schedule is dependent on how busy I am. Though I wouldn't put it this way, but putting it bluntly and truthfully, I volunteer when it's a bit easier for me. And he puts in parentheses, read that as convenient. I volunteer when I want, for what I want, and however long I want, even for who I want. And yes, I don't feel too terribly bad when I walk away feeling good about myself for the volunteer work that I did. But when I think about being a servant and servanthood, I have different understandings. Whereas I may volunteer because I want to, I serve because I need to. Volunteering may be a choice, but serving is a calling. And as a Christ follower, I am called to serve. There's a certain freedom that comes with volunteering. But serving, I am a servant of Christ. How many times does Paul use phrases like slave of Christ? So to me, he says, there's a different feeling of meaning between volunteering and serving. And maybe many people take church and serving at church a bit lightly because we view it as volunteering, not as a calling. We call it semantics. You see, Jesus has called us to be servants, not volunteers. And so we sing songs like we're going to sing later, Make me a servant because it doesn't come naturally to us. And so as we work through this month, as we look next week at the gifts of the Spirit and how to grow in that, I hope that you will spend time praying about how God has created you to be a servant. How have you been viewing it when there is a call for workers in God's harvest field in the things that we are doing in this church? Even like tomorrow night. Our church has the meal tomorrow night. And we're not called to volunteer to serve food to people, but to serve our community by feeding their bodies in a desire to also have an opportunity to feed their souls. It's a calling. It's a calling that God has placed on all of us. And we need to serve to be obedient, because we love God, and if we truly love God, it will overflow to others. And because for our own spiritual growth and health, we need to serve. God's already called you. If you know him, he has already called you to be a servant. And so I'm going to ask you today, are you answering as his servant? We are going to celebrate communion here in a few minutes. And I think it's so appropriate that it's at this table that we remember 
Jesus Christ, who today, in washing his disciples' feet, said, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have shown you this, do what I have shown you. Be a servant. And in communion, we remember the ultimate servant act of giving his very life for us so that we can become like him. Servants. It's not a pleasant subject because it can make us uncomfortable. But the, the joy of it is that in serving, we find the fullness of who Jesus Christ really modeled himself to be and not to us. So will you pray with me? And then we're going to move into a service of communion. And I want to encourage you in that time to look at yourself. What kind of a servant am I to Jesus? For Jesus. And how does he want to work through me? And use this time as a time of recommitment to being his servants. Heavenly Father, thank you for your time, your uh, time in teaching your disciples. You used visual illustrations that caught their attention to show them that you have called them to be like you. You have called them to serve. As we go through these next several weeks, help us, Father, to understand that you have commanded us to serve that our love for you will overflow in service, and that as we desire to grow, to be more like you, to have spiritual strength, vitality, and thriving, that service is an integral part of that. Help us not to shy away from it, but to embrace it, so that we can live in the fullness, the abundance of <coughs> that we have come to us. It's in the name of Jesus Christ.